On Friday, September 9th, 1949, just outside of a small town north of Quebec City, Canada, residents heard a loud explosion. Shortly after, a small plane plummeted from the sky and hit a rocky hillside, killing all 23 passengers on board. What seemed from the outside to be a tragic plane crash ended up being much, much more. This is the story of Canadian Pacific Airlines Flight 108. I'm Ashton, and welcome to The Haunted Corner. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Haunted Corner. Happy Monday. I'm super glad that you're here. I'm happy to be back. Last week, I had COVID and I could not finish my research. Couldn't record, couldn't finish anything. So here we are after a little week hiatus. I'm feeling much better and I'm ready for all the new stuff that I have for you. I hope you all enjoyed our little surprise spinoff episode. And now I'm back with a true crime tale for you all. You might be thinking, Ashton, this is a story of a plane crash. How does it tie into true crime? Well, I'm glad you asked. This story is wild. I got a lot of my information from a really good article in The New Yorker, which I will link to in the sources. So let's get into it. The story begins with a man named Joseph, or J. Albert Gway. He was born on September 22, 1917. He was the youngest of five children. His father worked for the Canadian National Railways and was killed in a train accident when Joseph was five. After his father's death, the family moved to a town just outside of Quebec City, Canada. As a young man, Joseph was known by many at the local pool hall. He was said to visit there often, selling watches and jewelry to make a living. He was an entrepreneur. He didn't have very much of a formal education, but he did pretty good for himself. He was described as short and slim with black curly hair and an engaging smile. He would go out of his way to be charming and courteous. When he had extra money, he was said to be generous with it. And in 1941, Joseph got a job at the St. Malo Arsenal in Quebec. And this was enough for him to get a deferment from serving in the military during World War II. He made 40 bucks a week at the time, and he would sell jewelry to other employees to make extra money on the side. He was working hard, and eventually he was able to purchase a car. And this got him a lot of attention with the ladies at the factory. And one specific woman in particular. This woman was a young brunette by the name of Rita Morell. The two fell in love and married in August of 1941 before moving to an apartment in Quebec. Now, there was another woman who worked at the factory that Joseph became close with. Her name was Marguerite Ruest. She was known to be a wild one. She enjoyed doing favors for people. One time she was in jail for two months for illegally selling alcohol, and she was even said to perform abortions for those around her. In 1949, she married a man with the last name Petre, and she would take his last name and become known as Marguerite Petre. Marguerite became fond of Joseph when they started working together. At one point, she was quoted as saying, quote, I am like a mother to him, referring to the younger Joseph. Her husband once became suspicious that Marguerite and Joseph were having an affair. However, they both quickly denied this accusation. When asked, Joseph exclaimed, quote, have you seen her? Impossible. Which is like, that's a little harsh, Joseph. <laughs> so the two remain nothing more than friends, and Marguerite introduced Joseph to her brother, Genero Ruist. Genero had suffered from tuberculosis, which caused him issues with his hips and required him to use crutches to watch, to walk. 
He was a watchmaker, and Joseph, as we remember, sold watches and jewelry and pendants for a living, so it seemed like they had some things in common. As the war ended, Joseph left the arsenal to become a full-time jewelry salesman. Joseph and his wife Rita moved to Seven Islands around this time where their daughter Liza was born in 1945. Things seemed to be going well. Joseph would travel from town to town selling his trinkets. He would find broken watches and would send them back to General Ruiz to be fixed and prepped for resale. They had a pretty good system going. One day, while he was out and about, Joseph stopped into a small cafe for a drink. While he was there, he struck up a conversation with one of the waitresses, who was a teenager named Marie-Ange Robitaille. She initially told him she was 19 years old, but she was only 17 at the time. The two began chatting and really hit it off. Marie-Ange knew all about Joseph and his wife and their daughter, but she didn't care. Rather than tell her parents the truth about the man she began seeing, she told them that his name was Rogers, Roger Angers, and they believed he was a good match for their daughter. Joseph, the jewelry salesman, even gave, gave Marie-Ange a ring. So she was convinced that this married dude was the one. Early in 1948, Joseph moved his family to Lower Town, where he opened a storefront, which had an apartment attached for the family. So he's playing family man with his wife, Rita, and their daughter, but he was also still seeing Marie Ange. This was about a year into their relationship. He was calling her several nights per week, and they were fully courting. Until one day, in November of 1948, things came to a head. Rita had begun hearing rumors being spread around town about her husband, Joseph, and the young mistress he had been entertaining on the side. So Rita took matters into her own hands, and she showed up at the home of Marie-Ange, Marie-Ange's parents, and she filled them in all about the man that their daughter had been seeing, and that he wasn't Roger Angers, and he was her husband, Joseph Albert Gway. The parents were not impressed, and they ended up kicking their daughter out of the house. So Marie-Ange was going through it at that point. Her parents kicked her out. Her boyfriend's wife was pissed, you know, rough. So she called Joseph and told him what had happened and that she had nowhere to go. So Joseph called Marguerite, his best friend, the helpful one, and he asked her if Marie-Ange could stay with her for a while. Marguerite agreed, so she moved right in before eventually relocating to another park apartment with Marguerite. Now, eventually, her parents wanted her to move back in, but they struggled to get in touch with her. You know, the 1940s will do that. She avoided them because she was convinced that they would make more trouble for her if they knew where she was staying. So she pretended to be staying in Montreal. Now, here is where things take a turn. Early in 1949, Marie-Ange decided that she wanted to go home to her parents' house and leave Joseph in the dust. She borrowed $50 for a train ticket from the owner of the restaurant that she worked at. And while she was on the train, getting ready to leave, there was a knock at the door. And who was it? None other than Cheaty McCheater himself, Joseph. He told her that if she didn't get off the train and leave with him, that he was going to make a scene. So eventually she agreed, and he took her back to their apartment. And to make sure that she didn't leave again... He threw her gloves into the stove and wrapped himself up in her coat to sleep. The next morning, he bit her several times in the face to get her to stay where she was, figuring she would be too embarrassed to leave the apartment with bite marks all over her face. He then went and cashed in her unused train ticket. So this guy sucks, as if we, you know, didn't already know that now. Now we definitely do. So Joseph, now realizing that his mistress is done with him, really escalates his craziness and comes up with a horrific plan. Since, in his mind, he couldn't get a divorce from his wife, that Catholic guilt will do that to you, the only other option was to have her murdered. In April of 1949, 
Joseph offered a family friend, a 21-year-old named Lucian Correo, $500 to kill his wife. His plan was for him to kill Rita with poisoned cherry wine, but Lucian refused to participate and called Joseph crazy. In June of 1949, Rita became fed up with her husband, took their daughter, and moved in with her mother. Marie Ange finally left Joseph as well, returned to her parents' house, and got a different job at a closer restaurant. So Joseph went from having two beautiful women in his life to having no one. One day, as Marie Ange was walking to work, Joseph walked up behind her and pulled a gun on her, threatening that if she didn't return to him, he would shoot himself and possibly her as well. She dismissed him, telling him to leave her alone, otherwise she'd be late to work. She had a lot more chill than I would in this situation. (laughs) But Joseph kept pursuing her, and eventually a policeman saw what was happening, and at that point, Joseph fled. The police officer escorted Marie Ange to work and hung around just in case Joseph came back, which he did, and he was taken to Municipal Police Headquarters at City Hall where he was booked for attempted assault with a deadly weapon. Once again, Joseph called Marie, Marguerite, his best buddy, and she got him a lawyer, who succeeded in having the charge reduced to one count of carrying a gun illegally. The next morning, he was fined $25, and he was released. So two days later, Joseph called Marie Ange and said that they had to meet. She reluctantly agreed, and when they met up, Joseph told her that his wife was going to have her arrested for damaging his reputation when she had him arrested for assaulting her. How dare she? He told her that she needed to immediately flee to Montreal and hide there until things calmed down. So the two fled to Montreal together, and there he bought her some new clothes and apparently paid so much attention to her that she agreed to fly with him to Septiles. However, things did not get better, and the two were fighting again within a week. Then they stopped speaking, and at the end of July, she left him and returned to Quebec. As she walked out, he handed her a note that said, quote, I love you terribly. We'll be together again very soon, end quote. A postscript instructed her to destroy the note after reading it, but she didn't. Now, at that point, things were at a burning point, and Joseph had to make a choice. He knew that the only way to keep up his relationship with Marie Ange was to marry her. But how could he do that if he was already married? Well, here we go. Back to the idea of getting rid of his wife. Now, Joseph was in a predicament because it was pretty common knowledge in the community that he was not faithful to his wife. So if she ended up dead, it looked pretty suspicious. He didn't want to be directly involved in the murder of his wife or be present when it happened, so he was having to get creative. Now, for reasons that are still unknown, his bestie, Marguerite Petre, and her brother, General Ruiz, pretty quickly agreed to help Joseph get rid of his wife. Joseph offered General money and a discount on a ring that he wanted to buy for a woman who he had gotten pregnant. Apparently, he had also at one point tried to take Joseph's, wife's, Joseph's wife, Rita, out on a date one night while her husband was away, but she had turned him down. Marguerite, on the other hand, she owed Joseph $600, and he promised to cancel that debt in exchange for her assistance with the murder plot. Joseph returned from a business trip on August 17th. The next day, he met with Marguerite and Genero, and they discussed making a bomb. Genero volunteered to put together a detonating mechanism in his workshop, while Marguerite was tasked with the job of buying some dynamite and detonating caps and a length of fuse. She went to a hardware store and found that it is impossible to buy dynamite in Canada without signing for it, so she signed a fake name, telling the clerk that she was making the purchase on behalf of a woman who wanted to blast some tree stumps. She bought 20 half-pound sticks of dynamite, 15 detonating caps, and a 30-foot length of fuse, and she took them that evening to a restaurant she was working in. 
she wrapped the dynamite in a piece of plain brown paper that had enclosed some bags of potato chips and gave it to Joseph when he stopped by. He then took it to General Ruiz before leaving on a vacation with his wife Rita, which she thought was a reconciliation. It was just him being a douche. So Joseph comes back from his vacation with his wife. He went to visit Genero to see what kind of progress they had made on the bomb while he was gone. Well, they hadn't made any progress, apparently. And at the same time, a customer walks into the shop to leave a watch for a repair with Genero. And Genero exclaims, quote, here's a man who can tell us all about dynamite. Which he could because the customer was apparently a miner. But I can just imagine Joseph elbowing General, like, shut up. <laughs> so Joseph exclaimed, explained to the customer that they wanted to use the dynamite to kill fish in a lake and began asking him questions. The customer was like, no, guys, you're not going to do that. He's like, it's dangerous for amateurs to fool around with dynamite. And he told them about a time when a man he knew had lost a hand that way. But the men didn't really care what the customer said, and they were set on the bomb idea. So they decided to rig up a time bomb consisting of an alarm clock, a dry cell battery, a detonator, and a detonating cap. So they began experimenting with the idea. But they were distracted by Marguerite and her genius idea. Her plan was to enlist the help of a neighbor who was a taxi driver to take Joseph and Rita out on a ride in the country. The plan was to have the bomb in the trunk of the car, and at some point, something would go wrong with the car, and then when the driver and Joseph went to get help, the car would explode, killing Rita. So Joseph and Genero, hearing this idea from Marguerite, were like, well, yeah, that sounds great. So they invited the cab driver over, and after hearing the plan, the cab driver was like, uh, no, I'm good. I don't want to blow up my taxi. Thank you. And then he left. Marguerite had a feeling that maybe she wasn't as discreet as she should have been when she was telling the cab driver her plan. So she immediately tried to cover her tracks, saying she was joking. You know, it's very funny, Marguerite. I love jokes. So Joseph was like, all right, scratch the car idea. How about a plane? Let's blow up my wife's plane. Joseph had two suitcases full of jewelry and in storage at Baia Kilme and decided to send for his wife for them. On the afternoon of Tuesday, September 6th, Joseph went to the Canadian Pacific Airlines ticket office in the Chateau Frontenac and made a reservation for his wife on the 10.20 a.m. plane to Baia Kilme on the morning of the 9th. Then he invested 50 cents in a $10,000 flight insurance policy on his wife, naming himself as the beneficiary. Early on the morning of the 7th, the airline called Rita at her mother's home to advise her that a reservation had been canceled on that day's flight, and that if she hurried, she could have the vacant seat. Well, Joseph, who was still staying there, answered the phone and said that his wife couldn't change her plans so quickly. And this wouldn't have worked for Joseph either because the bomb wasn't ready yet. So Joseph and Marguerite made plans to meet at the railroad station in Quebec at 8 o'clock on the 9th of September after putting the finishing touches on the bomb. After some careful planning, Joseph instructed Marguerite to rig the bomb to go off at 10.45 a.m. on the 9th when he predicted that the plane would be over the St. Lawrence River where the wreckage would end up. So the morning of the 9th, Joseph arrived at Genero's home around 7 o'clock a.m. to pick up the bomb. The package was ready for him, packed in a cardboard carton and set to go off at 10.45. The men wrapped it in brown paper, tied it with a string, wrote fragile on the front of the package in bold letters. They addressed it to a non-existent Alfred Plouffe at Baie Comé and identified the sender as Delphus Bouchard of St. Simone, a town 100 miles away from Quebec. Joseph took the bomb in a taxi to the railroad station where he checked it in a 10-cent public locker and went to the station cafeteria for breakfast. He spoke to a few of the railroad employees before heading off to meet Marguerite. 
Joseph gave the package to Marguerite, who took it by taxi to the airport, 12 miles out of town, where she arranged to have it shipped out on Flight 108 that morning. Then, she returned to Quebec in the same taxi. At that time, Joseph rushed back to his mother-in-law's house, where he told his wife that he couldn't sleep, so he had gone out for some coffee. She was getting ready for her flight at that time. And then at 9.30 a.m., the couple took a taxi to the Chateau Frontenac, and Rita left for the airport, from there for the airport. Joseph called Genero's house and spoke to Marguerite, who let him know that their plan went off without a hitch. What they didn't know, though, is that the plane was delayed by five minutes at takeoff. So when the bomb went off at 10.45 a.m., the plane was not over the river. It was over the Cap Tremente National Wildlife Area. The plane did explode, killing all 23 people on board, including Joseph's wife, Rita Morrell. There were 19 passengers on board, including four children, and there were four crew members crew members who were also killed. Joseph was wandering the streets at the time of the explosion. He told his mother-in-law that he had a headache and she went to the drugstore to get him some medicine. Around 1 o'clock p.m., news began to spread of the plane crash. People were calling Rita's mother to see if her daughter had survived the crash, and she asked Joseph to go see what was going on and if Rita had survived. So he takes his daughter to the ticket counter at the airport where he asked the girl who was working if there was any truth to the rumors of the plane and if the plane had truly crashed, which the woman confirmed was true. Joseph collapsed into a nearby chair, sobbing uncontrollably. The area where the plane had crashed was pretty remote. It was located up a steep mountain trail and was difficult to access. Joseph, along with the husbands of two of Rita's sisters, tried to get as close as they could to the scene of the accident, but they were turned away by police. The scene was horrific, as plane crashes are, and many believe that this was a normal plane crash. But the Canadian Pacific Railway was a little bit confused. There hadn't been a passenger fatality on any of the air routes since 1942. Joseph was already thinking about how he could make out even better in the situation that he caused. Two days after the crash, he called his lawyer to inquire what legal steps he should take against Canadian Pacific in the event that the company was found negligent. Before long, there were several agencies looking into the crash. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Department of Transport, and the Provincial Police of Quebec were all investigating. The bodies of the victims were taken for autopsy, and the crew members were checked for signs that maybe something had happened, they had lost control of the plane, but there were no signs to explain the crash. Joseph declined to identify his wife's body, and at her funeral, he went all out. It was very lavish. She had an $800 casket and a large cross of roses. Joseph was playing the bereaved husband role pretty well. Everyone at the funeral knew that he had been cheating on Rita, but they still felt felt sorry for the grieving man. Behind the scenes, though, investigators were starting to suspect that something wasn't right with the circumstances surrounding the crash. Investigators were beginning to believe that the plane had blown up prior to the crash. They spoke to witnesses, including a fisherman, who reported that they heard an explosion before seeing the plane falling from the sky. The plane had gone down nose first, and there was evidence that the plane's engines were still turning over when they struck the ground, because the tips of both propellers were bent forward, which to engineers meant that they had been spinning when they hit the ground. The first people to reach the spot of the crash reported having smelled something that reminded them of dynamite, which was definitely not an accessory on a plane. The Aeronautics Act of Canada forbids any plane to carry dynamite as cargo except under very rare and controlled circumstances, and no authorization to carry dynamite had been granted for Flight 108. Investigators soon realized that there had been an explosion and that it had come from the forward baggage section known as the number one compartment on the left side of the aisle leading from the cabin to the control room. The seat closed 
closest to this compartment was found a quarter of a mile from where the plane crashed, meaning that it was blown out of the plane while the plane was still in the air. The cargo compartment had been emptied after the first leg of the trip, so there were only eight items of luggage belonging to passengers on the plane. This included three Air Express packages. One of these contained automobile parts, another contained lingerie, and the third was a 25-pound parcel that had contents unspecified, and it had been shipped, according to the manifest, from Delphus Bouchard of St. Simone to Alfred Plouffe of Bayacome. So obviously, investigators were pretty interested in this particular package, but something was weird. Nobody named Alfred Plouffe was known in Bayacome. A man named Delphus Bouchard, who was a resident of St. Simone and a night watchman on a bridge, said he didn't know anything about any such shipment. Nor did Mrs. Delphus Bouchard, who was a resident of Montreal and was no relation to the night watchman. No one knew anything about these fake people. That's weird. The baggage clerk at the Quebec airport remembered a dark-haired woman in her 40s who had arrived by taxi shortly before the plane was scheduled to take off and had departed in the same taxi. The baggage clerk remembered that the taxi driver had carried the parcel into the terminal for the woman before they departed. Around the same time, the investigators were cross-checking the passenger manifest and trying to make a connection to who could have been the target of the explosion. There were three Kennecott Copper executives on board, but no one could think of any enemies that they may have made. As they made their way through the passenger list, they came across the name of Rita Morrell, and she was the only one in the investigators' minds who may have been a credible target of the attack. To the public, including Joseph, the crash was being considered an accident. So Joseph must have thought at that time that he was off the hook. But police made the connection between Rita and Joseph, and they recalled a little incident that Joseph had with Marie Ange previously when he was arrested. So they decided to go talk to Marie Ange. They described the dark-haired woman who was seen dropping off the package at the airport. And Marie Ange was pretty certain that they were talking about Marguerite Petre. So the next step was to identify her concretely. They were able to get in touch with the taxi driver, and his name was Paul Henry Pelletier. And he described Marguerite and the package, which was labeled fragile. He had only made one round trip to the airport that day, so he remembered it well. He didn't know who the woman was, but he remembered the trip. Police needed him to identify Marguerite, so they had him hang outside of her apartment in hopes that she would come out, you know, like different times, folks. So she eventually came out of her apartment, but she was wearing dark glasses, so it made it difficult for the taxi driver to identify her. So police were still waiting for the right time to get Marguerite, but Paul Henry struggled to keep his mouth shut and started talking to a reporter that he knew. The reporter wrote a story that, without mentioning names, said the police were hot on the trail of a woman who had delivered an unusual package to the airport. The story was published on the 15th of September. On the 18th, Joseph went over to Marguerite's place for the first time since the explosion, and he invited Marie Ange over and claimed that he wanted her back after observing a mourning period and hoped that they would live happily ever after. It didn't seem like he had seen the news story that was written. But then, the next day, he returned to Marguerite's house, and it was a different vibe. He was clearly upset having seen the report, and he was claiming they were in big trouble. But, being the clever man that he was, he had a plan. His plan was for Marguerite to die by suicide and leave a note confessing to the explosion. Marguerite was not on board with this plan. She was like, no, I'm going to pass. Thank you. The next day, though, Marguerite called her doctor, complaining of stomach pains, and asked him to admit her to the hospital, which he did. And while she was in the hospital, she took just enough sleeping pills to make her drowsy. She would later go on to say that she felt the staff were not showing enough interest in her case and wanted 
to attract her attention to her condition. So while this was going on, Joseph was trying to get Marie Ange to go out with him and celebrate his birthday, which she declined. She's like, hard pass. Thanks, Joe. Shortly after that, Marguerite was released from the hospital and returned home where she was questioned by authorities. She admitted that she had taken a package to the airport on September 9th. She said that she had done it as a favor to Joseph and that he had told her the package contained a statue. Joseph was eating dinner at his mother-in-law's house when he heard the news of what Marguerite had told police. He was not happy. A warrant for his arrest was issued, and he was picked up the next morning and arraigned on a charge of murdering his wife. Bye-bye. He was locked up in Quebec's men's jail, and while he was there, police overheard him saying that General Ruist had made the mechanism of the time bomb for him. So he was throwing everyone under the bus. The police went to Genero, who admitted this, but said he thought the bomb was going to be used to blast tree stumps. Joseph's trial began on February 24, 1950. The trial lasted two and a half weeks, and it was really exciting for the town. Joseph was not interested in the trial, and he did not testify in his own defense. His only display of emotion throughout the entire trial was when Marie Ange took the stand and said that she didn't love him anymore. Joseph was found guilty of murder on March 4th, 1950. For reasons only known to Joseph, he did not file an appeal. The prosecutor said that if he could not live with Marie Ange, he did not want to live at all. So Joseph Albert Guay was executed on January 12, 1951, at the age of 33. His last words were translated, at least I die famous. Genero Ruiz was arrested for murder on June 6, 1950, and tried in November of that year. The jury had the option of convicting him for manslaughter, but chose to convict him of murder. Marguerite Petre was arrested on June 14, 1950, and she was tried separately. Both were sentenced to death by hanging. General Ruiz was hanged on July 25, 1952, and because he was still suffering from tuberculosis, he had to be transported to the gallows in a wheelchair. Marguerite Petre was hanged on January 9, 1953. She was the 13th and final woman to be hanged in Canada. And that is the story of Canadian Pacific Airlines Flight 108. It was a doozy. Poor Rita and her poor daughter had to grow up without both of her parents because her dad was the worst and just couldn't couldn't just divorce his wife. <sighs> Thanks for tuning in today, though. I hope you guys enjoy, enjoyed the episode. The sources for today's episode will be listed in the show notes and also on the blog post for the episode at www.thehauntedcorner.com. Check out the other episodes of The Haunted Corner available now wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts with new episodes dropping every Monday and Thursday. If you're enjoying the podcast and would like to share your support, head on over to Patreon. You'll have access to the exclusive Patreon-only episodes, early and ad-free access to episodes, plus so much more. Head over to patreon.com forward slash The Haunted Corner to join now. Follow us on social media at The Haunted Corner on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. If you're enjoying the podcast, please be sure to tell a friend. And if you have a case suggestion or correction, please send it to thehauntedcorner at gmail.com or submit it through the website. Until next time, be kind and take care of yourselves and each other, and we'll see you soon. Bye.